Hello, everybody. Welcome to poem number four. Yes, number four. Now, we're going to be reading The Vampire by John Stagg. <clears throat> Two things I want to talk about when we're talking about The Vampire. One, and I'll put it up to you right now because you don't have it in front of you. You're going to notice that The Vampire, I think you can see it, is spelled P-Y-R-E rather than P-I-R-E. That's just an old English way of spelling it, just so you know. Um, the first written down story in English vampire story was called The Vampire by a guy named John Polidori. Um, and it's a really kind of cool story regarding how that came to, to, to be. Apparently, John Polidori, Lord Byron, Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, and another person were having kind of like a sleepover. You know, they're all hanging out and they were staying over at one of their houses. And they decided it was a dark night that somebody came up with the idea of everybody comes up and writes their own horror story to try to scare each other in successive nights. And John Polidori went and wrote this poem, or it's actually a novel, uh, called The Vampire, and it's spelled P-E-Y-R-E. So that's why you'll see that sometimes. Uh, a little quick side note, Mary Shelley actually went and uh, wrote Frankenstein based upon that little competition. So... Um, to think about it, it was a pretty awesome little horror story that they had that they that created the two of them. So anywho, another thing to talk about when we're talking about the vampire as a title is this is our fourth poem, right? We read Dead Vampire, The Old Woman of Berkeley, and The Woman of Corinth, The Old Woman of Corinth, The Woman of Berkeley and The Old Woman of Corinth, and now we're reading The Vampire. I'm going to call it The Vampire Number One, and the reason why I say that is because after we read our next poem, which is The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, we're going to be reading another poem called The Vampire. Same spelling, just a different author in a different time period. It's like 50 or 60 years later. I forget. We'll check it out when we, when we read it. Um, just so you know, if I say The Vampire 1 or The Vampire 2, The Vampire 1 is this one just because we read it first. Now, this was written in 1810. And I don't know if anybody's noticed this yet, but our poems have been written. I, I picked them in time order. So I think first it was 1798 and then 1804 or something like that, or 1747, 1748, 18, whatever. But they've been moving up in time. I thought that's pretty cool as well to see how the story kind of evolves, the vampire legend. But let's read the vampire, shall we? Now this is, I counted it out, I believe I counted 38 stanzas. Um, uh, so I have broken it down into half, so we're going to read half the stanzas today, and then we'll read the other half uh, in another reading tomorrow or later this period, whatever I choose. Um, so let's go. Are we ready? The Vampire. Now, as always, when we read any poem or short story in this class, you're going to fill out a vampire story page for me, and you're going to pick one of three positions. Is this a vampire story? Um, is it not a vampire story or I can, it's not a vampire story, but I can see why somebody made the mistake because there's so many seemingly vampiric references in there. Um, just the name of the poem itself, the vampire tells me it's probably a vampire story, but who knows? Sometimes people make jokes with their titles. So let's do it. The vampire by John Stack, 1810. Why looks my Lord so deadly pale? Why fades the crimson from his cheek? What can my dearest husband ail? Thy heartfelt cares. Oh, Herman, speak. So, I mean, already it starts off with a semen, seemingly vampiric reference, right? Why it looks my lord so deathly pale? Why fades the crimson from his cheek? Or, I mean, it could just be that this guy's sick, right? Because the wife is begging him. What's wrong with you, dude? You've been getting so pale lately. You've been seeming ill. Please tell me what's wrong. Why, at the silent hour of rest, dost thou in sleep so sadly mourn? Has thou with heaviest of grief oppressed, griefs too distressful to be born? The one thing I want to say, I mean, it might not be vampiric, but the fact that she says, why at the silent hour of rest? What do you think the silent hour of rest is? Most people are asleep at what hour? The silent hour? Midnight. Remember, I have told you before, and you may have learned in your research, that midnight is the time when vampires are at their most powerful. I don't know. Just an idea. Let's continue. Why heaves thy breast? Why throbs thy heart? Oh, speak, and if there be relief, thy Gertrude shall or shall impart. If not, at least, shall share thy grief. Now, this sounds like a lovely wife, right? She's saying, please, share with me your problem. Maybe I can fix it, right? Or at the very least, I can share your pain with you. Let's continue. Wan is that cheek, which once the bloom of manly beauty sparkling showed. 
Dim are those eyes in pensive gloom, the late with keenest luster glowed. So she points out again, two things about you that are very different and very, they're, they're making me nervous, Herman. One, you're so pale. Wan is that cheek, which once showed the bloom of manly beauty sparkling showed. So you used to have all this life and color in your face and now you're dim and pale, almost dead looking. What's wrong, dude? And then, of course, she says your eyes. There's something wrong with your eyes as well. They don't have that keen luster. They're dead eyes almost. Let's continue. Say why, too, at the midnight hour, you sadly pant and tug for breath as if some supernatural power were pulling you away to death. Now, that's a serious, that whole stanza is pretty seriously. Why at that midnight hour? So, again, there comes that that phrase midnight hour, that the, the hour that vampires have their, their most powers, their strengths are at their strongest. And why always at the same at the same time every night? Very strange. Restless though sleeping, still you groan, and with convulsive horror start. Oh Herman, to thy wife make known that grief which preys upon thy heart. Okay, so always at midnight you freak out, and then you freak me out. What's going on, dude? Help me, please tell me. Oh Gertrude, how shall I relate the uncommon anguish that I feel? Strange as severe as this my fate, a fate I cannot long conceal. So he says, I don't know how to tell you this. There's something really bad going on and I'm not gonna be able to hide it from you for much longer. How do I tell you? How do I share? In spite of all my wanted strength, stern destiny has sealed my doom. The dreadful malady at length will drag me to the silent tomb. See, that's, that's a tough sentence right there. He says, it's over for me. I'm doomed. I, can, I cannot be a help anymore. I'm at, the, I'm, at, I'm at my end. But say my Herman, What's the cause of this distress in all thy care? That vulture-like thy vitals gnaws and galls thy bosom with despair. Dude, tell me what's wrong with you, please. I can help you maybe, please tell me. Sure, this can be no common grief. Sure, this can be no common pain. Speak if this world contains relief that soon that Gertrude shall obtain. Bro, please tell me what's wrong and allow me to go find a fix. I mean, not for nothing, but if you're sick, why aren't we talking to a doctor? Why aren't I taking you to some you know, professional so that we can look at this? Come on, help me. Oh, Gertrude, tis a horrid cause. Oh, Gertrude, tis unusual care that vulture like my, my vital gnaws and galls my bosom with despair. And he says, baby, it's really bad. It's so bad that even thinking about it is kind of driving me crazy. It's bad. Young Sigismund, my once dear friend, but lately he'd resigned his breath. With others, I did him attend unto the silent house of death. He said, remember last week when my buddy Sigismund died? You know, he was my best friend, one of my good friends. And I went to his house, to his funeral house with a bunch of other people to attend to him, you know, to, to sit through his wake and his funeral. For him, I wept. For him, I mourned. Paid all to friendship that was due. But sadly, friendship is returned. Thy Herman, he must follow too. So he says, I was a good friend, but because of my friendship, I'm dying now as well, all right? He's bringing me with him. I must follow to the gloomy grave in spite of human art or skill. No power on earth my life can save, tis fate's unalterable will. He says, he's taking me with him, he's killing me now. As I speak, I'm dying and there's nothing we can do to stop it, nothing. I'm already basically dead, honey. Young Sigamund, my once dear friend, but now my persecutor foul, doth his malevolence extend even to the torture of my soul. So not only is he really hurting me and killing me, he's also taking away my soul from me. So obviously that's a vampiric note right there because as we know, once you turn into a vampire, you lose your connection with God, your soul is gone and you are forever barred from heaven or barred from any of God's grace, right? Um, so he says, he's really hurting me. And I look at this, my one dear friend, but now my persecutor foul. If you persecute somebody, it's like you continually torture them. This, this guy is continually torturing me. Order, share, mortals, share. My soul dog dreadful, vigils key more keen then, which hell scarcely knows. He says, let's, just, let's read that one again. By night, when wrapped in soundest sleep, all mortals share a soft repose. You know how every night when we all go to sleep and we're supposed to be safe and sound, 
My soul doth dreadful vigils keep, more keen than which hail, hell scarcely knows. So whatever's happening to me is happening at night while I'm sleeping, while I'm supposed to be at my safest, right? Something's happening to me then, and that is when my soul is being taken from me. I want to point out, side note, that we have read in our first poem, if you remember, Dare to Vampire, when does the vampire go and take her? with his vampire kiss, do you remember? When he turns her, when he kills her, turns her, takes her and brings her with him while she's sleeping. Would be a lot more in the old days. They would, vampires, you'll notice, come at you while you're sleeping, when you are at your, I don't know if weakest is the right word, but certainly it should be while you're at your safest and soundest, right? When you're, when you're, I don't know how to say it, but you should be safe while you're sleeping, right? Everybody sleeps safe, right? Everybody says that. So it makes it even scarier because how can you stop something while you're sleeping? How can you defend against it? You cannot. And everybody has to sleep, right? Um, plus, it's awesome. Who doesn't like sleeping? I love getting a good night's sleep. So to get you at that point, that's eh, kind of tough. Let's finish with one more stanza. From the dear mansion of the tomb, from the low regions of the dead, the ghost of Sigismund doth roam and dreadful haunts me in my bed. So he says, he comes to me at night and he gets me. Now, here's my problem. He knows this is happening. Why isn't he doing anything to stop it? As far as he knows, it's over. That's the end for him. Um, we will find out when we read part two of The Vampire by John Stagg. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, remember what I said. If you already have the idea of whether or not this is a vampire story, although you should hold your final thought until the end because everything could switch up at the end. It could be all like one big joke. Ah, oh, honey, I was messing with you. <laughs> I don't see that happening but I would still wait. But certainly you could be filling it in. Remember what I always say, if you already have three reasons why you believe it's a vampire story, but you keep coming on to more, just jot those down somewhere else because the more you have, the better. Um, very fantastic job today, everybody. Thank you very much.